In this video tutorial, we will introduce the law of definite proportions and percentage composition. Let's do a sample question that we are comfortable and familiar with before we jump into chemical proportions. Looking at this pie diagram on the right, what percentage of pets are dogs? And the equation I would use is percentage of dogs is equal to number of dogs divided by the total number of pets times 100%. So that would be 5 dogs divided by the total number of pets, which is 10 plus 6 plus 4 plus 5. Making a total of 25 pets altogether. So 5 out of 25 times 100% is 20%. So 20% of pets in this instance are dogs. Now, what percentage of pets are mice? Well, we'll use the exact same equation, but instead of dogs, we'll use mice. So now it's 10 mice divided by the 10 plus 6 plus 4 plus 5, because that's the total number of pets, which is 25. 10 divided by 25 gives you 40%. But now what if I want to find the percentage by cost is used to feed the cats? So here's the price list. To feed one bird, it costs a dollar. To feed one cat, it costs five. To feed one dog, also costs five and to feed one mouse costs a dollar. So the percentage of the cost to feed just the cats is equal to the cost to feed all the cats divided by the cost to feed all the pets times 100%. Since there are four cats, each one costing $5, it'll cost me $20 to feed all my cats. There are 10 mice, each one costs a dollar to feed, so 10 times one. Six birds, each one costs a dollar to feed, six times one. Four cats, each one costs five dollars to feed, and five dogs, each one costs five dollars to feed. If we tally all this up, it ends up costing us sixty-one dollars to feed all the pets. So what percentage of the cost is for feeding the cats? Well, twenty dollars divided by sixty-one times hundred percent gives me thirty-two point eight percent. So thirty-two point eight percent of my budget to feed all the pets is diverted solely to feeding the cats. I think you're starting to get the idea now. So if I wanted to find the percentage by cost used to feed the birds, take away the numerator instead of cats, put in birds, six. Instead of five dollars, it only costs them one dollar, put in one. So six times one would be six dollars. Six dollars out of the 61 gives me about 9.8%. So now that you understand this example, let's apply it to atoms. With regards to the water molecule, what percentage of the atoms are hydrogen? So just like in the previous example, percentage of hydrogen atoms is equal to the number of hydrogen atoms divided by the total number of atoms altogether in water. In this case, there are two H's, so two atoms of hydrogen. But there are three atoms altogether, one oxygen and two hydrogens. So two divided by three times 100% is about 66.6%. .6%. Now let's do the same thing, but for oxygen atoms. you notice the exact same equation, but instead of H atoms at the top in the numerator, we're looking at oxygen atoms. So since there's one atom of oxygen, there's still three atoms in total. One out of three times 100% is 33.3%. Now what if I want to look at these percentages by mass instead? So what is the percent of the hydrogen's mass out of the total mass for the entire water molecule? So I take the mass of the hydrogen atoms and divide it by the total mass of all the atoms in the water molecule, then multiply by 100%. Since there are two hydrogens, and each hydrogen has a mass of 1.01u, we can find these values from the periodic table. Well, 2 times 1.01u gives you 2.02 .02 atomic mass units. To calculate the total mass of the water molecule, you have 2 times 1.01, .01, because that's the two hydrogens, and 1 times 16, because 16 is the mass of the one oxygen atom. That comes out to 18.02, .02, so 2.02 .02 divided by 18.02, .02, times 100% gives you 11.2%. So hydrogen makes up 11.2% of the mass of an entire water molecule. If we wanted to do the same for oxygen, you'd have the exact same equation, but instead of mass of H atoms, you replace it with mass of oxygen atoms. Going through the calculations, we end up with 88.8%. So if a question asks for the percent composition by mass for a particular element, what it's asking for is the mass of an element in a compound expressed as a percentage of the total mass of the compound itself. Just be aware that the percent by mass is not the same as the percent by subscripts. That's like saying the percent of dogs 
and the percent of how much dogs uh, cost in terms of feeding everyone, they're not going to be the same percentages because the first value just involves the dogs, while the second value involves the dogs and factors in how much it costs to feed them. Well, similarly, I have two hydrogen atoms out of three atoms in total, so percent of H atoms is 66.6%. .6%. But if you look at the mass, the mass of one hydrogen atom in comparison to the mass of one oxygen atom is much, much smaller. And so the percentage composition by mass for hydrogen is 11.2% and not 66.6%. .6%. There's a two different percentage values for two different questions. So just be aware, when a question asks what is the percent composition for a substance, they usually mean by mass, not just by atoms. As you'll see in a few moments, this percentage is not as useful as this percentage. All right, so just keep that straight. By convention, whenever they talk about percentage composition, they are usually referring by mass. So while hydrogen is two out of the three atoms, 66.6% .6 in terms of atoms, it's only 11.2% because each atom is so small in mass compared to the mass of the oxygen atom itself. So let's try this example. Find the percent composition for each chemical formula. So remember, when they say percentage composition, they mean percent composition by mass and not by atoms. So let's try HGO together. So the percent of mercury is equal to the mass of the mercury divided by the mass of the mercury oxide times 100%. But you'll notice they didn't give me any values. That's because I can find them on the periodic table. So mercury has a mass of 200.59 atomic mass units, while oxygen is 16 atomic mass units. So 200.59 U divided by the 200.59 for the mercury plus the mass of the oxygen, which is 16, gives you 92.6% after you multiply it by 100%. To find the percent composition for oxygen, we do the exact same thing, but instead of mass of mercury, we use mass of oxygen. So now it's 16U at the top instead of 200.59, but the denominator remains the same because the mass, the total mass, remains unchanged. 16U divided by the total over here times 100% gives you 7.4%. Now, some of you are thinking, why not just go 100% minus 92.6%? Uh, why do you go through this whole calculation all over again when it's much easier to do this? Well, you definitely can, but I like to do it this way in order to double check. Because if I goof up on this calculation, then this answer is wrong. And if I try to do the 100% minus this number, this answer is also wrong. By redoing the calculation all over again, I can now add these two up and see if they add up to 100%. And of course, they do add up to 100%. So that's just a little double check to ensure that I've got the right answers. Now, if you're running out of time on a test and you have nothing to lose, then by all means, 100% minus this, get this answer immediately. Uh, but if you have the time, I recommend doing it all over again just to make sure that they add up to 100% as a double check. However, be aware, due to rounding issues, you may not always get exactly 100.00%. You may end up with a 99.9% .9 total or a 100.1% .1 total. So due to rounding issues, you may not always get exactly 100%, but it should be very, very close, plus or minus 0.1 of a percentage point. All right, so try and practice the rest of these ones yourself. Answers are at the very bottom, so double check your work. Now, the law of definite proportion states that the elements in a chemical compound are always present in the same proportions by mass. So water, for example, will always be 11.2% hydrogen by mass, whether you are using numbers from the periodic table, so theoretical ones, or if you're using actual mass values from an actual experiment in the lab, these percentages will always be the same. As long as you're dealing with water, H2O, it doesn't matter if you're using theoretical values from the periodic table or actual values from an experiment, those percentages should be the same. If these percent compositions do not match up, then it's a different substance. That's the only way you'd have a different percentage composition by mass. So this is a very powerful tool. There may be some instances where I may not have enough data for my experiment, and so I will need to substitute in theoretical values from the periodic table to help me complete the rest of my calculation. And the law of definite proportion says that's okay because these percentage compositions are identical. As long as you're talking about the same compound, these the breakdown, the percent composition should always remain the same. So let's take a look at this example over here. Find the percentage composition based on the mass data, not the periodic table data, but the mass data provided down here. To find the percent composition of potassium, we take the mass of potassium 
and divide by the mass of the whole thing, potassium dichromate, K2Cr207, then multiply by 100%. It says I've got 13.3 grams of potassium, so I'm going to pump in 13.3. Divide by a 50 gram sample of the whole thing, well, 50 grams. Multiply by 100% and you get 26.6%. To solve the remaining elements, chromium and oxygen, just take away the mass of the potassium, put in the mass of the chromium. If you want a percentage of oxygen, take away the mass of potassium, replace it with the mass of oxygen. Answers are at the bottom down here, so please confirm, but I want to try something else. As I mentioned earlier, the law of definite proportion states it doesn't matter if you're using uh, theoretical values from the periodic table, or if you're using actual values from an experiment. Those percent compositions should remain the same. So let's try it out. These are the values we got from an experiment, but what if I used values from the periodic table instead? Let's try calculating percent of uh, potassium using those periodic table values. So the percent composition of potassium is equal to molar mass of potassium divided by the molar mass of K2Cr207 times 100%. I can find these molar mass values from the periodic table. Potassium is a 39.1, chromium is a 52, while oxygen is a 16. Since there are two potassiums, I got 2 times 39.09. And then for the total, two potassiums, 2 times 39.09. 2 chromiums, 2 times the 52, and 7 oxygens, 7 times 16, for a total molar mass of the entire compound. Punch this in your calculator, and you get the exact same value, 26.6%. So whether you use real-world experimental values, or theoretical values from the periodic table, these percent compositions should remain identical, thanks to the law of definite proportions. Now a common question some students ask is, why did I multiply by 2 over here, but I didn't multiply by 2 up here. That's because the question worded it this way. It says 13.3 grams of potassium in total. So that's the total number of potassiums, 13.3 grams. Whereas this theoretical value over here is from the periodic table and is based on just one potassium. So because this molar mass is based on just one potassium, you need to factor in two of them. All right, so try this other one yourself and compare your answers. But otherwise, let's move ahead. All right, what percentage of vehicles in this parking lot are Honda? So again, I would take the number of Hondas, 15, and divide by the total number of vehicles, 15 plus 21 plus 32 plus 7, and multiply by 100%, and this should give me 20%. So 20% 20 of the vehicles here are going to be Honda. Now, if there are 150 vehicles in the parking lot, approximately how many would you expect to be Honda? Well, I would take 20% because I know that approximately 20% of the parking lot are Hondas, so 20% of the 150. So convert 20% into a decimal, so 20% out of 100% is a 0 0.2, so 0 0.2 times the 150 gives me 30. So 20% of 150 vehicles are going to be 30 Hondas. So using this as a comparison, let's try to answer this question. Calculate the mass of nitrogen in 150 grams of NH3. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is find the percentage of nitrogen in ammonia, just like we found the percentage of Honda out of the whole parking lot. Find the percentage of nitrogen in ammonia. But because they don't give you any values over here, I'm going to need to find them from the periodic table. Hydrogen is a 1.01, .01, while nitrogen is a 14.01. So as I mentioned before, there will be some instances where you will not be given enough information, and so you will have to use the theoretical values. But that's okay, because the law of definite proportion says whether you use theoretical values or real values from an experiment, you should get the same answer anyway. All right, so the percent of nitrogen, molar mass of nitrogen is 14.01 uh, grams per mole. Molar mass of NH3, there's one nitrogen, but three of the hydrogens, so three times 1.01, .01, with only one nitrogen, 14.01, .01, and that gives me 82.2%. Now that I know that nitrogen makes up 82.2% of ammonia altogether, NH3, Therefore, 82.2% of 150 grams, I'm going to turn this back into a decimal by dividing by 100%, and that becomes 0.822 times the 150, leaving me with 123.3 grams. So if I ever had to break up or decompose 150 grams of ammonia NH3, I know that 123.3 grams of nitrogen will be released in the process, because 82.2% of ammonia will always be nitrogen by mass. All right, so try these ones out yourself. You can find the percentage of nitrogen in each of these compounds. Once you find the percentage of nitrogen, 
we're going to assume that each compound weighs 150 grams. So I want to find out what is the mass of just nitrogen in N2O. What is the mass of just nitrogen in NH4NO3? Now be careful, the nitrogen appears twice over here. What is the mass of nitrogen in 150 grams of strontium nitrate? And what is the mass of nitrogen in 150 grams of HNO3? Answers are at the bottom. Give those a try. Now, the law of definite proportion seems pretty straightforward, and to some extent it is, but it can be applied to much more complicated situations. Let's take a look at this example from the textbook. It's pretty wordy, so it will challenge your reading comprehension, but give it a try. Press pause, when you're ready, press play, and we'll take it up together. Now, as I read this question, I'm going to write information down. I'm a visual learner and I need to see the entire problem laid out for me. So, a typical soap molecule consists of a polyatomic anion associated with a cation. Alright, so some mystery soap molecule contains a cation and some sort of polyatomic anion. This anion contains hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. So now I know there's hydrogen inside, carbon, and oxygen inside the polyatomic anion. I just don't know how many of each are inside this polyatomic anion. But then it goes on to say that one particular soap molecule has 18 carbon atoms. So I can put an 18 for the subscripts over here. Now it says it contains 70.5% carbon, 11.5% hydrogen, and 10.4% oxygen. And these are all mass percentages. It then goes on to say that there is one alkali metal cation. So I'm just going to call it X and there's only one of them. So it wants me to identify what is the identity of this cation. So anytime they're asking me for the identity of an element, or in this case a cation, I probably want to try and solve for its molar mass. If I can find its molar mass, I can then look it up under the alkali metal section and find out which of these alkali metals most closely matches its molar mass, and that would be the identity of my mystery alkali metal. So the first thing I'm going to do is find out what mass percentage is X. And I'll do that by subtracting these percentages from 100%. Whatever is left over must be X. And that gives me 7.6%. Now the next thing I can go on is that they told me that 70.5% by mass is the same as 18 carbons. Although I don't have any actual mass values, I know that because of the law of definite proportions, I can use the theoretical values from the periodic table instead. Since each carbon atom is approximately 12.01 grams per mole, and since there are 18 carbons, well, 18 times 12.01 equals to 216.18 grams per mole. So that tells me that 70.5% of the total mass is equivalent to 216.18 grams per mole. So then 7.6% represents how many grams per mole? So now I can set up a ratio where 70.5% is equal to 216.18. Well, 7.6% equals to what? X number of grams per mole. According to the law of definite proportions, this ratio of percentages should be the same ratio with theoretical values. So the molar mass values from the periodic table. Rearranging this equation, the percentages will cancel each other out, leaving me with the units grams per mole, which is what I want. I want the molar mass of X. Solving for that, I get 23.3 grams per mole is the molar mass of X. Since they told me that it's an alkali metal, it has to be someone from group 1, can't be lithium, can't be potassium, too big, too small. Sodium, that's very, very close. 22.99 is very similar to 23.3, which means the unknown metal cation is sodium. So looking back over here, sodium. All right, so try some of the homework questions regarding percentage composition and law of definite proportions. Uh, my recommendation is actually to check out the old textbook. Those questions tend to be a little more interesting than the new textbook questions. In our next video, we will cover the topics of empirical and molecular formulas, as well as hydrates.